Okay, so just by way of introduction, uh, my name's Deanne Wooden and I'm the Senior Project Officer at QUAST. I started in this role in October last year. Some of you or all of you maybe may be familiar with um, Amy Johnston, who was the um, pro Senior Project Officer for around six years. So Amy um, went off to a, a new job um, in about August last year. So I came on board in October. So even though it's been just over four months, I feel like I'm still learning the ropes here at COST. But um, one of the highlights of the work that I've been doing is trying to meet as many tuck shop conveners as possible. And, you know, again, ideally would love to meet people face to face, but unfortunately because of the situation, we do have to do these kinds of things online for now. Um, so this is just a bit of an agenda of what we're going to be working through in this meeting. Um, so first of all, just welcome to everybody. We Cost acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands from across Queensland. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the state. And because this is a metro meeting, I expect that most people joining today on the, uh, are joining from the lands of the Turrbal and Yuggera people. So now I'd like to um, do a bit of an around the virtual room introduction. So, so yes, Chris Ogden here, Executive Services Manager at Quast. Um, I don't think there's anything else I need to say. <laughs> okay, and I'll actually ask um, my colleague sitting next to me here to introduce herself. Uh, yes, my name is Colleen Hogg. Um, I am here for four hours at Woolwind State School on a Friday to assist Tanya Lee, but I like to call myself 2IC. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. And Chrissy. Hi, I'm Chrissy. I'm um, the Communications Officer at Quest. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, hi, I'm Nancy. I am from the Fig Tree Pocket State School Talk Show. Thanks, Nancy. Sharon. I'm Sharon. I'm the convener at Ithaca Creek Primary. Thank you. And um, Mum's iPhone, Mum XR. Oh, that's me, I think. <laughs> yep. I'm Megan. <laughs> I'm Megan. I'm the um, convener at Pennygrove State High School. Thanks, Megan. Oh, hi, Megan. We've been talking hi. via email. <laughs> Chris has been helping me out heaps, so thanks, Chris. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, Tanya Lee, you're next. Tanya Lee's the convener here at Wollowan State School, and um, she's going to take us on a bit of a virtual tour of her tuck shop uh, once we're finished introductions. Uh, Christine. Hi, I'm Christine. I'm a student from QUT, and I'm working on a project at Quast at the moment. Thanks, Christine. Gabriella. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriella. I'm also a QUT dietetic student um, attending placement at QUAST. And Gabriella came in and did a bit of volunteer work in the Wollowan State School Tuck Shop this morning. So yeah, thank you for that. Fun. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie. I am the Food Service Manager at All Hallows School. Great, thanks Katie. Suzette. Hi, I'm the convener from Wandle Heights State School. Which one, sorry? Wandle Heights State School. Wandle Heights. Yep. Excellent. Thanks, Suzette. Marcy. I'm um, Marcia and I'm the um, committee principal for Newmarket State. Okay, great. It's great to see so many new faces and I do hope that I get to come around and meet everybody eventually. Uh, Joyce, you've just joined us um, and we've just gone around the room, um, the virtual room and done some introductions. Did you want to just quickly introduce yourself? I'm the, I am the required um, canteen convener from um, One School Global. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everybody. Great to see you all. So we've done our introductions around the virtual room and now it's over to Tanya Lee, um, the convener of Wollowan State School from where we're joining you today um, to do a bit of a virtual tour. And I'll just introduce Tanya Lee just to say that um, she has had to be very adaptable in the last uh, month or so. Uh, her tuck shop is actually undergoing some renovations at the moment. So she has been moved into the school hall, which seems to be a very, very much a hub of activity in the school with um, all of the school music lessons being held in there as well. And she 
Tanya Lee also manages the tuck shop, the, sorry, the uniform shop at the school. So the uniform shop set up there and um, the tuck shop set up there. So, um, you know, she'll be able to sort of talk to you about some of the, uh, the hurdles she's had, had to overcome to continue to efficiently run her tuck shop. So I'll um, put it back over to you, Tanya Lee, if you're there. Yes, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, excellent. Uh, so, yes, as Jan said, my name's Tanya Lee. Um, I've been the tuck shop and uniform convener now here at Waterwind for approximately, oh, coming up eight years. Um, it's a great little community school. Um, I've seen a lot of transition happen throughout that eight years. And one of the most recent ones is moving into our new little space that we have here which is very tiny. Um, we've actually had some renovations happening up at our pool, which also adjoins our tuck shop. So we're down here for the foreseeable future. Um, with our uniforms as well, we've also moved down here to the floor. So you can probably look at some music in the background. And that's also our um, music teacher having lessons as well. So, so bear with me if there's a little background noise. So with our tuck shop here, we do a lot of in-house cooking. Um, so everything from our hot meals through to our high plates and snacks. And so I'm just gonna grab our menu as well. So this is our menu that we have. So we've had that in place now for approximately about two and a half years. Um, we had Chris come out and do an evaluation for us. So they're being really vital for us to, especially for myself and the position when we did move to Smart Choices. Um, it was a total foreign area to myself. Um, they've given lots of guidance and it's something that we did slowly. So it wasn't overnight, it was something that we've just um, slowly introduced. Our school and our community have really embraced it. Um, but we also do um, a variety of other things. So even though, yes, we are smart choices, we still do some treat days on a Friday for our students as well. So it's about having compromise and a balance with our school community, which I think for us anyhow works really, really well. Um, we do a lot of manual processing in here at the moment. We are currently shifting to online um, this week, which will be exciting. Um, so yeah, that's our little tuck shop. So does anyone have any questions? Tanya Lee, Chris here. Uh, so are you set up in the hall at this stage? Yes, we're set up in our hall. I've just put our shutters down. Um, so that it's a little bit quieter. So we've even got um, like everything, like all our cooked food, we can't store in here. It's just too much. So we've got an outside space, which we do use, um, which the school has been very kind enough to allocate to us, as well as another room in the hall for all our uniforms. So a nice, cosy little working space. So when do you expect to have the new facility available? We don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about possibly May. Um, we found out probably about a month ago our wall that adjoins the pool. The only thing that is there is drip off and stuff. So there's nothing structural there. So it's about our safety for Colleen and I, I think it was a very good decision to move us out and rather than close because um, we'd already started um, back at work and we've done all our key cooking. So one of the things we do in here is a lot of prep work. Yeah, each day we have certain tasks that we do. Um, I only have one volunteer, which comes in on a Tuesday and that's Anne. She's a lovely, lovely lady. She does all my baking for me. So she's fantastic at muffins and pikelets and everything like that. So, and then Colin, who you all met earlier, she works with us on a Friday and she basically, like she said, she's my two IC, so everything I do, she does. Yeah. And how many students and how many days a week are you open? Yeah, so we're open five days a week. So Monday to Thursday, we're open from until 12 o'clock and we do first break only. 
uh, we are open two breaks, the first and second break on a Friday. And we have approximately around about 330 students at our school. So we're a quite a small school. You are, yeah. Um, our yeah, and our community and our principal, um, we're very much a community school. So we're all about making sure that it's a service to the community. So we're very lucky to be open those five days. Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of support. We're actually involved with a harmony day, which is coming up this week. So yeah, we've done a special meal day for that. So that's about a quarter of our school. We're just over a quarter have made orders. So it's going to be a big day Friday. Exactly. What is the meal deal? So we're doing sushi and bento boxes. Lovely. Yeah. So we give them an option as well. We've got a drink that they can add on to that. So we, especially when we're doing our pricing for something like that, we make sure all our costs are covered. And we usually come out with quite a nice profit once we do a special meal deal. So it's really important for us in here to try and meet our budgets that are set. Um, which we touch up can be one, can be a bit difficult at times to do that. But yeah, we definitely have um, probably three out of the four terms where we're profitable. So compared to seven years ago, we've got you know, that's a big step up. So we're really happy we're at the level that we're at now. I'll stop hogging the questions and let other people ask questions now. <laughs> What were those times again for, that you're open at the tuck shop? So we open from 8.30 a.m. to 12, Monday to Thursday, and Friday from 8.30 through to 2.30. And our uniform shop, we open five days a week, and that's from 8.30 to 9 a.m. five days a week. Thank you. You're welcome. Tammy, um, Lee, it's Sharon here from um, Ithaca Creek. Hi. Hi, Sharon. Um, I'm really impressed that you're operating out of this um, this <laughs> makeshift kitchen. I really am. I, 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 so you do all your cooking there in the kitchen? Yes, we do. Yeah. Right. Um, we do, I can take you outside. It might be a little bit noisy, and I'll quickly show you our freezer. So... Bear with me and the children. And I'll show you when I go into your hand on the I'll just throw out a little bit fast. <laughs> <laughs> and so Tammy, are you preparing your food on each of those mornings or do you have additional hours to prepare that food? So currently it is slightly additional, only because um we can't do service in a small space and cook. It's, it is just mm. tight. But generally, yes, um, I would tee it up when I've got so and my volunteer or Colleen on a Friday. I'd set them tasks to be cooking while I'm doing other things. Mm. Um, mm. We try and do it within our a lot of hours. Um, it's just in this space. Um, yeah. So that's probably that's why we do such a big bulk cook, so that we can just keep that going. We would normally have done a, a second cook halfway through a turn, but just because we've been to when a phone was coming to school and days on and days off, um, yeah, that we're probably on track to cook when we come back for turn two. Mm, very impressive. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> It really is about being organised. Um, like I said, we're not online. We're very old school here. So it's a brown paper bag. Um, we have a run sheet, which is this one here. So a run sheet. 
and that's basically in, I would call it our Bible. So we start from the top, we work our way down, and as we prepare everything, it's all about timing. So as one thing goes in, another goes out, one goes in. Um, so it's about also multitasking, pulling in the test too. Um, when she's in, she'll be doing two, three, four things in a five-minute period. It's just not doing one task at a time. Mm. So mm. just about getting really familiar about your processes and really making sure that um, you can do them quickly as well. Quickness is a really big thing in our kitchen. Um, we don't move slow, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tanya Lee, something that I was quite struck with um, when I came in and really had a look at your space and look at your menu is how very um, streamlined your menu is. And I think that probably helps a lot in terms of being able to manage the workload is that you don't have huge amounts of items on your menu. You've got items there that are, you know, mostly green and also um, really popular with the kids. So. Yeah. Yeah, you don't seem to have many many things on there that aren't a popular item. So you're sort of sticking with the things that will sell well. Correct. And when I first started, I mean, our menu was probably triple the size it was. And we would just have all this stock sitting there not being used. So it was really important for us to streamline everything um, so that we can be really maximise our effort and our time when we are at work. Because really, I mean four hours in a morning isn't a lot to get everything done so yeah which, which course was it again that's great does anyone have any other questions for tanya lee before we move on we're doing the yeah yeah i'd like to ask um what's um spurred on the switch to online ordering um a couple of things um so we, I feel like we're almost prehistoric in our <laughs> record keeping um, in terms of across the board, everything from being able to analyse our menu through to knowing exactly how many items we're selling over the counter versus um, our actual individual sale or bag sales. Um, I'm really big on, I like transparency. I think it's a really good way that helps a business grow. And that's how I see Tuck Shop and the Unicorn. It's a business. So without that transparency, it just makes it so much harder. We have a, a prepaid account where people have come in by FPOS, put money down and we deduct it. When we first started that, it was fine, no issues, but we have over... 50 families on that now and it's just it's purely not manageable mm -hmm. so um our school is also going through a massive massive growth spurt we've been we've purchased new land so our school within the next three years is going up to over 600 students so over double so we just want to um want to have that infrastructure in place so that we can be very familiar with those processes and make sure that we grow with the school as well. Yeah, perfect. Sounds like you're going down the right path. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if that's um, everything from me, Deanne, I'll, I'll log off my end and I'll come back down to you. Great, thanks, Tanya Lee. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Okay, See you soon. <laughs> Okay, so I'll go back to sharing my screen um, and go back to just getting through the rest of the meeting now. So um, I will send this um, presentation out to everyone who's attended today and the, the menu that Tanya Lee uses is on the presentation, but it's also on the website, the school website, so you can go and look that up if you like. But as you can see there, it's pretty simple, um, but you know everything on there is popular with the kids. So um, really well done, Tanya Lee, and thank you. So next part of the meeting, just wanted to share, you know, some new things that you might not have heard of uh, about what's happening at COST. So um, as of in around November last year, we started a new style of membership called rolling membership. So previously, up until November, um, PNCs or tuck shops could only join at, at the beginning of 
uh, July or the membership period was beginning of July until end of June. So that was a bit of an obstacle for um, PNCs that might have wanted to join in September or January, understanding that they wouldn't get the full value of their membership for the 12 months. So now um, PNCs or tuck shops can join any time of the year and they will get their full 12 months of value from that joint. So um, hopefully that will encourage more um, members to, to keep up with their membership and for new members to join at any time of the year. Secondly, our Talking Tuck Shop magazine was um, sent out to schools um, around the beginning of February, is that right, Chrissy? <laughs> I think it was. Um, and so just wondering, you know, have you received your copy? Um, one of the, a, a single copy was sent to every school in Queensland, and we do know that a lot of them don't get to their, don't get to the tuck shop conveners, but that's okay because a lot of the information in there is useful to all um, areas of the school environment. We also have that magazine available online. So if you wanted to, um, if you didn't get your copy in your school and you can't track it down, you can go onto the cost website under the um, news media section and you'll be able to find the talking tuck shops magazine on there so um, the next thing healthy tuck shops program so this is um, this tuck shop network meeting today is part of that program um, we uh, cost receives funding from health and wellbeing queensland which is a government agency, a health promotion agency, and we receive funding to run a healthier tuck shop support program, which is all about getting information about healthy eating, health and menus, menu planning, um, et cetera, out to tuck shop conveners, PNCs, and the school community in general. So we've got lots of deliverables as part of that funding, and these network meetings are one of those. Lots more menu planning resources, more recipes to be planned um, in the coming months. So look out for that information. We also have now a landing page for the tuck, uh, Healthier Tuck Shops program on our website. So you can go on there and, and see what's new um, from the Healthier Tuck Shops program. One of the notable pieces of communication is an e-newsletter, um, which again will be emailed to all schools um, once a quarter or once, sorry, once a term. Um, so our newsletter went out a couple of weeks ago and we've started planning the content for the next one to coming out in probably um, mid to late April in term two so look out for that one in your inbox as well. Uh, training that we've got coming up we've got a food safety supervisor course coming up um, next Monday the 21st of March um, so if you're needing to uh, update your skills on food safety, certainly register for that one or the next one is the 16th of May. And both of those courses are face-to-face -face and they're held at the cost office. We have also recently, thank you very much, Chris, for all your hard work on this. We have launched a new food safety supervisor refresher course, and that's online only. Um, that's available now, and that is available only to members of course. To do that course, you have to have done some sort of food safety supervisor course in the past. So it, it is just a refresher course. It's a lot shorter. I think it's about three hours, um, and it's obviously a lot um, more of a discounted um, price compared to the food safety supervisor a course. So if you haven't done um, your food safety supervisor course for a couple of years, three or four years, it, it's a good idea to just update your knowledge and skills through that refresher course. And on, in the same vein, we also now have a free food handlers course, which is also only available online. And that's really aimed at people who come into tuck shops and do some volunteering and also potentially other staff that don't need to have the full food safety supervisor course. They can log on um, and do that free food handlers course. And that's available to everybody. You don't need to be a cost member to do that course. So we really encourage conveners to get any volunteers that come in to go through. It takes about an hour to do and you do get a certificate at the end of that course so if you've got volunteers coming in and you'd like them to be aware of just safe food handling practices and you know how to avoid contamination and personal hygiene around food then that would be a really great course for them to complete so now just um, quickly, each of these Tuck Shop Network meetings, I want to do a quick nutrition um, update. Um, I'm a nutritionist, a dietitian by background, and part of my role in POST is to really get information out to Tuck Shop conveners and other sectors of the school environment about healthy eating. And obviously, you know, we talk about smart choices, but there's more to healthy food and healthy food and drink supply and um, nutrition outcomes comes for children. There's more to that than just smart choices. So, you know, this is just a way to develop your knowledge um, 
around healthy eating for kids. And so this nutrition update today, um, what I'm talking about is um, a type of foods that are increasingly being termed as ultra processed foods. Now, these foods tend to be um, foods that are manufactured. Um, they're not foods that you would cook um, from scratch in your kitchen. They're usually heavily marketed and they're usually not very healthy. So if you're looking from a smart choices perspective, um, some of these ultra processed foods, a lot of them would be um, considered to be red, they would be classified as red, but some of them actually do scrape into the amber category. So what I wanna talk through today is a little bit of a description of when an ultra processed food might just scrape into amber, but really um, is, is probably more of a red choice and how to actually you know, um, detect whether that it, it really should be, it really is a product that maybe shouldn't be served on the tuck shop menu. So the definition of ultra processed foods are formulations of food substances modified by chemical processes and assembled into ready to eat products, which are hyper palatable. So basically that means that they're not real foods, they're, they're co combinations of ingredients that have been put together in, in a factory basically, to be ready to eat and they're usually very tasty but evidence shows when they're doing um, research around um, and getting people to consume these types of foods what they're finding is that they're really tasty so they make people want to eat more they've got all these flavor enhancers and and other things in there that make them taste really good and make you want to eat more but they don't actually um, signal to our gut that we're satisfied. So we, um, they're foods that we can tend to overconsume because they taste really good, but they don't really satisfy our hunger. These foods are also tend to be heavily marketed. So they usually have quite sophisticated packaging um, and they're advertised or marketed really heavily. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we really want to see is much less of this marketing and advertising targeted at our children who don't have the skills to identify that these foods aren't healthy. They're usually very cheap to produce. So for, in terms of, you know, from a food manufacturing perspective, um, it's quite attractive to, to food, food industry to produce these foods because they're very cheap. Um, they're made by multinational com com companies and they're sold in lots of different countries around the world, um, usually at, you know, fairly high prices and um, like I say, heavily promoted. These foods tend to be high in kilojoules, um, usually have a lot of either fat or salt or sugar or all three of those so they you know they have all of those what we would call tend to call negative um, nutrients in them and they usually tend to be low in nutrients because they're not real foods they're these food commodities which are assembled together so they tend to be low in fiber don't have a lot of protein and certainly don't have um, many vitamins and minerals in them what we know um, when they do nutrition surveys in Australia is we know that around 50% of the kilojoules or the energy that we're consuming in the general Australian diet um, comes from these ultra processed foods. And so that means that they're over consumed in Australia. And we also know from the evidence that consumption of these ultra processed foods can lead to obesity, to chronic disease and to gut problems. Now, I don't wanna dwell on negative um, issues, but it is really important to understand that these foods are ubiquitous. They're the foods that you would find ten, tend to find in the middle of the supermarket along all the shelves. Next time you're in the supermarket, when you go in, have a look at what's around the edges of the supermarket compared to what, what's in the shelves um, in the middle of the supermarket. And that's where your, your ultra processed foods tend to be. So they're, you know, they're really ubiquitous, really um, heavily marketed and um, over consumed in Australia. So what does that mean for smart choices? So I've decided to use the chicken nugget as a case study to demonstrate um, what a, an ultra processed food looks like. So you can see here, we've got the nutrition criteria for red foods um, according to smart choices. And if you look at the chicken nugget, you would um, tend to go to the crumbed and coated foods um, category to look for the nutrient sort of content, looking for the cutoffs um, that you might use to determine if a food is amber or if it's red and really shouldn't be on your menu. So if you look at um, a particular brand of nuggets, Steggles nuggets, 
If you're looking at this table here, you can see that the cutoff there for energy is, um, if it's more than a thousand kilojoules, it would be red per 100 grams. The Steggles nuggets are 839, no problems there. Saturated fat, um, you wouldn't want it to be more than five. You can see it's 1.2 and sodium, you wouldn't want it to be more than 700. And you can see that the Steggles nuggets are fitting in there at 560 milligrams. So for all intents and purposes, using smart choices and those cutoffs, you would say, okay, chicken nuggets are, a, um, an amber food. So that's no problem if you're looking at it just from a pure nutrition cutoff um, or nutrition criteria perspective. But let's let's have a think about how we can identify ultra processed foods. And there is a, um, a really simple checklist and this is also available on the COST website. How do you know if something's ultra processed? If it contains more than five ingredients, you would tend to know that it, it's probably, you know, assembled in a factory with lots of different ingredients. Does it contain industrial ingredients? And a way to think about industrial ingredients is anything that you see in an ingredients list for a food product that you wouldn't use in your own cooking. So you can see in the box there on the screen, lots of different examples of industrial ingredients. So if you're, you know, if the product that you're looking at and looking at the ingredients list, it's got more than five ingredients there and it has um, lots of these industrial ingredients, they're pretty good um, indicators that it might be an ultra processed food. Is a product in sophisticated and attractive packaging, and it might even claim a health benefit. And that's again the food food industry really pushing these products onto the, the general population. So if it looks really pretty in the packaging and it says it's good for you, then you can usually assume that it's an ultra processed food. And does it have a long shelf life? So um, if you were to cook something from scratch, how long would you keep, for example, bolognese in the freezer? Would you keep it in there for more than three months? Probably not. So similarly, um, these ultra processed foods, they are processed to be able to stay shelf stable in a freezer or on on your shelf um, for much longer than the three months that we would tend to keep our own products or foods that we're cooking from scratch. So let's have a look at these um, Steggles crumbed chicken nuggets. Here's your ingredients list. I counted there's about there's over 24 ingredients in this and all of the ingredients there that are underlined are industrial ingredients. So you can see there that there's a hell of a lot of those ingredients that are industrial ingredients. If you're looking at the packaging, you've got three and a half stars. Now in New South Wales, they don't use a traffic light guide in schools. They use the, um, the stars, the health star rating to decide whether um, foods can be served in tuck shops. And lo and behold, 3.5 is the minimum. So these foods could be served in tuck shops in, in um, New South Wales as well. It also tells us they're free from hormones and free from artificial colors and flavors, but it didn't, doesn't tell us what's in there. It just tells us the things that they've left out, but there's a lot of things that they've added in that we really don't wanna see in the foods that we're serving to ourselves or the kids. Let's have a look at the shelf life. So this is a product specification from that product. You can see there, shelf life, 548 days. So that's nearly two years that this product could sit in your freezer um, before being considered to be out of date. So you know, from, my, from my mind, um, looking at that, that product, I would tend to say that that's definitely an ultra processed food. You might think about, are there other options that you could use to serve on your tuck shop menu other than the, the chicken nuggets? Some other ultra, like common categories of ultra processed foods, sweet or savory packaged snacks, cakes and cakes mix, uh, mixes, cereal and energy bars, ready to heat products, your prepared pies, pasta, pizza dishes, poultry, nuggets and sticks, burgers, hot dogs and other reconstituted meat products. So all of those things that come in packets that have long shelf lives that when you look at the ingredients list are really long and involved with lots of industrial ingredients likely to be ultra processed foods and you know if there's an alternative of something that you can cook yourself in your tuck shop that um, doesn't have all of those industrial ingredients added then have a think about it because it's likely to be a lot healthier might still be an amber food but it's a much healthier amber product than um, these ultra processed foods okay so I'm going to, uh, before I um, go on, does anyone have any questions about that very quick nutrition update? Nope. Okay, so um, next part, oh, sorry. sorry. I couldn't get longer to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I just want to make it really clear that although that particular chicken nugget uh, does meet the AMBER criteria, it would still need to be served as part of a meal. 
uh, to me. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. I should have pointed that out, Chris. And, you know, that's actually, that's a good point. And that's that's one of the reasons why um, we do say that chicken nuggets and other products like that need to be served with the, the salad or the vegetables or as part of a meal because they don't contain the nutrients that a meal should really contain when kids are um, having, having their main meal from the school tuck shop. So they don't contain the fibre, they don't contain the vitamins, the minerals that the vegetables and or salad would provide. So that's why it's really important to pair those um, ultra processed foods or the less healthy amber foods with something that's a lot more healthy to make sure that the kids are getting what they need from, from that meal. So now, like I say, over to um, everyone online again. I'll just quickly share my screen again. This um, is a networking part of, um, of the meeting where People can ask each other questions. Um, if you've got a particular menu success, um, you know, if you've introduced a new menu item which has done really well, um, or if you've met a really great supplier that's been really helpful and, and helping you find um, really good products to sell in your tuck shop, or if anybody is new to um, their role as a tuck shop convener, um, then, you know, this is a chance to, to try and um, match up with someone who's got lots of experience who might be able to help you out in your new role there. So I'll um, stop sharing and, as I say, over to everybody on the meeting now. This is the, the, the networking time. Can, um, it's Marcy here. Can, um, hi, Marcy. hi, what do people serve in tuck shops? I mean, there was a lot of stuff that is talked about that we do, like chicken nuggets is served with a salad, but we do have hot dogs, we do have hot pies, but that's all you don't get a salad or anything with. So what do other tuck shops conveners do? We have fish fingers, but we have them with a salad and we have hamburger meats with um, lettuce and tomato on a bun, you know. But Nat, who we spoke about before, the new convener there, she, um, she wants to have a much healthier tuck shop than what we have at the moment, which I'm all for because I'm just a volunteer Plus, I'm on the committee, on the head of the committee, the tuck shop committee. So I just wondered what else people serve. Well, in our tuck shop, Marcy, we, one of our big items is bolognese. I mean, I hope you can hear me. Um, it is, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. We do bolognese. <laughs> We Sharon do food. bolognese. Um, we do bolognese as well, but there's talk about they want to go on to a company that manufactures it, and I'm not really fussed on that now. Well, look, we can get probably we do around about fifty to fifty-five portions um, when we're doing our batch. We right. can get that done probably cooked and packed within about an, an hour, hour and ten minutes. So. It, it's not a long process. It, again, it's about having those processes in place so that you've got um, your convener and your volunteers are working together uh, to make sure certain tasks are done. But with us, we do mac and cheese is something we just introduced. That was at the end of last year. Um, yeah. That was a big request from our kids. Um, that's taken a couple of times of cooking it to sort of tweak the recipe. Um, and fried rice is another one that we offer, which is vegetarian. But it's probably not our biggest seller, but it's definitely one of those. Pizzas. Um, we also use um, our pita pockets, which are very versatile. Deanne saw those today. So it's one item that we use for our burgers, our pizzas, um, what else do we use them for? Burgers and pizzas? That's mm. everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So pizzas is another item that is very quick, very easy to do. Um, doesn't take a lot of prep time to do those as well. So, so when you talk be... when you talk about the the um, pocket breads, you just put the get a pocket bread, put the um, sauce on it, and the ham or pineapple yeah. or whatever, and then just put them in the 
Correct. Yep. Yes. So we, okay. we go through quality foods and they're called mini um, pita pockets. They're only about that big. Yep. We put them in the microwave for about 40 seconds because yeah, they thaw. just to thaw out. Then we cut them all the way around, split them in two. So the one pita pocket actually gives you two pizzas yeah. yeah and it's an ideal serve it's good for the kids to handle um portion wise it's it's filling for them as well yeah. and it's all natural like it's all healthy food yeah yeah it's um again you, i suppose in touch up as you're all aware we need to just be careful about quantities so just making sure when we're putting it on it's not overloaded because yes. the skyrockets the price of your pizzas out of the window but yeah yeah and, and we're going to try things. a few things. Sorry. We're going to try a few things this winter, like soup. Yeah, so we're going to be trialling soups this Does winter. Does anyone do soup at their school mm. in winter? We do oh. nachos in winter and we do um, chicken fried rice. Okay. So has anyone done a soup previously? Because... It's I something have. we've been wanting to do and we've had requests for it, but our concern is how do we get that to the students safely? Yeah. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's I've done the thing. You have to... Some of the packaging just isn't good for hot food. You know what I mean? It, for, you've got to have the soup at a reasonable temperature and then kids being children, if they knock it, you know, that's still a warm soup. Yes, my, my yeah. experience of soup was oh, my experience of soup it was quite a few years ago that I tried it. It wasn't a big seller, okay. so um, I feel like the parents liked the idea of soup more than the kids did. Um, okay. I haven't tried it again. That could be different, um, but you know, Sharon, did I, you did you serve it with bread? Yeah, we did. We served it with okay. garlic bread. Um, oh gosh, I thought that would have made it really popular. Just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we served ours in a um, triple walled cup, um, and you know, obviously, it's not going to be it's not going to be super hot. So that if they spill it, it's more warm. You know, like yeah. warm to hot, they mm -hmm. can't burn themselves. But we barely sold any. I ended up okay. giving it to the teachers, and we tried it several times. But um, I mean, it's worth a try. Yeah, but some things maybe are, if you don't have a huge extensive menu. Um, it might sell better if you take other things off that you you know would sell in summer. Remove some of those items and replace with soup. So then there's less things to choose from. I don't know. Well, I make my own baked beans, and Nat and I were talking mm. yesterday about doing a pot of baked beans because you don't have to have baked beans really hot, and you could do a bowl of beans with bread. And just have it lukewarm. But I had for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> cheesy beans are a good I love them. Sorry, what was that? Um, cheesy beans have been a yeah, bit, yeah, not not overloaded, just but with a nice melted cheese on the top, and sometimes a dollop of pesto that can go down well with some bread. Kids just love um, cheese, so you put okay. anything on top of <laughs> cheese on top of anything, and they'll eat it. So, but I just thought because baked beans to make are so cheap and, you know, you just puree your tomatoes up and you soak your beans overnight and you cook them and throw it together and it's just hoping that the kids eat it. What but do you it's... serve it in to give to the children? Well, we haven't done that. We haven't done okay, it. Sorry. I make it at home myself and Nat and I were talking yesterday about it and, and she's into healthy eating and so am I. And we were saying about, you know, beans would be great. We You can get, we've actually got we've some, actually got some, long, oh, some oh. oblong containers that we thought they'd been there forever in a day at Tuck Shop that we could put them in that and then just have a piece of bread with it. Does anyone... Um have a really good relationship with the, the staff at the school. Like, yeah. Do you get a lot of staff orders? Like, how do Not you go many. About the principal does. You probably um, you probably get about. Some of them have standing orders. That's too mm. used to have standing orders. I mean, we haven't been open this year, so I I don't know yet. 
Um, but yeah, in the last couple of years while I've been doing it, we have had a couple of standing orders and then teachers just come down in the morning and order, but you don't get a lot. And I think mm -hmm. it's our menu that's letting us down because it's not, it's not something I would eat. So, and I think some people just, it's not something that they would eat. That's why I'm interested in the food part of it. Yeah, I mean, definitely pizza's on our end. I know oh, a big seller and the bolognese is, and also something simple, toasted ham and cheese sandwich. My God, our students at our school absolutely love a simple ham and cheese toasty. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Something well, see, I've seen, we, just, um, we don't do oh. things like that. We we do toasties, but we just do um, a toasty and then just wrap it into paper and put it in a thing. And it dries out. For me, that's what I find is a problem. It dries out in the warmer. Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of, over the years we've done quite a number of different ways. Uh, one of the best ways we've found that's worked for us is um, once you make the sandwich, uh, we use a spray oil. So a spray oil just very lightly on the bottom and very lightly on the top and doesn't dry them out. Um, and do we you, keep them in the you, hot box. Do you do yours in a breville or do you? Um, yeah, just, it's just a sandwich press. We, yeah. Okay, because we found one of them yesterday when we were cleaning. <laughs> we, we, make them, we make them as we go. We don't make them and freeze them. And no, no, them. no, they're fresh. Made fresh yeah, made yeah. yeah. Well, we do a pizza, but we do it in a long square or rectangle, and we have tomato puree on the bottom, and then the ham and cheese and that on the top. But I don't like how it's done, and and the way that you were talking about is how I see a pizza. It's a good seller, but the kids often say, "Can we have round pizzas?" And <laughs> the other lady that used to do it wasn't interested in changing anything, whereas this one's quite happy to. She's Isn't quite happy mean? to be a bit different. Not at that stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea, a fruit platter. So our school encourages the kids to um, pick a game or something rather than using food as a celebratory uh, item. So, yeah, uh, back to your, sorry, I've missed your name uh, at the beginning. My name? No, not you, Marcia. Who, uh, oh, Tanya. Tanya. Tanya and Colleen. Hi, so, Colleen. So with your mac and cheese, do you freeze that as well and then reheat it? Yes. Yep. yep. So that item, like Colleen said, it's um, a new item. It's taken a few goes to um, sort of tweak that recipe. We've really had to, it's first time it came out a little bit dry, like it was great when we were tasting it, but when it was um, defrosted, it was a little bit on the dry. So, yeah. so now we've got it, the proportions just right. So. I think it's like anything with all your recipes, it's just trial and error um, and just be patient with it. If you feel it needs a bit of a tweak, give it a tweak and don't sort of be shy to do that as well. But yeah, our mac and cheese, our fried rice, our bolognese um, are all frozen. Um, yeah. Is there a veggie oh, in the mac and cheese? Oh, it's, um, it looks too moist, too mm -hmm. wet. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't it? But yeah. once it's cooled down, packed, frozen, it's fine. Yeah. Is it just milk based or there's cream in there as well? No, just milk. Yeah. Yeah. You said before about um you buy those pizza bases from quality foods and beverages. Is that it? Correct. Um, what are the names of the pita bread? The pocket bread? That's their mini pita pockets. Mini Pitta Pockets. Okay, thanks. Ladies, I um, actually have to finish the meeting up for myself, which also means Daniel and Colleen, because I need to get to school, pick up, um, pick up my daughter. Um, but 
feel free to keep going um, for the others in the meeting if you if you want more discussion and if I Tanya, might put my phone can join back with yeah, her phone. Well, so I'm really sorry, but I do have to get right, to school pick up. Right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, ladies. Thank and you. we can keep going to about Bye. past three. Um, and then we've got a convener course that I'll have to use the Zoom account for. So yeah, get it in now. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm fine. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Thanks, Martia. Bye. Bye. I have a nugget question for those that serve nuggets with salad. What kind of salad and how do you package it? And we'll speak of one. Um, well, I know in the, so I've started volunteering in my little boy's um, tuck shop and they serve chicken nuggets with a salad and they just serve it in um, just the, um, like a, not the car, the recycled cardboard material container. Um, and it's just a simple salad. So iceberg lettuce, um, tomato and cucumber. So is the container an open container or? So it's one of those ones that um, clips in. Like, you know, the, I can't think like of a, the material. A hamburger things. clam, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Gotcha. I've also Thanks. seen the nuggets done with fried rice um, and often done like that. They, they'll do them in just a square foil container. Um, and then I've also seen them done as like a sushi bowl and the nuggets used as the crumb chicken. Um, so that's sort of like with some fried rice uh, or even just plain steamed rice, a um, bit of cucumber or whatever vegetable that it, it sort of varies, the, the chicken nugget and then some nori sheet cut up on top. And that's usually in a, cl in a clear like takeaway type container so you can see the veggies and stuff. Can't imagine how to do that when you've got like 70 serves of it's nuggets. not something you want to do uh, much of like on, on every day you might only want to do it um, as a special or something like that because it would be very time consuming compiling all that mm. if you have a look at the um, Bly Bly Facebook page Bly Bly State School yep. um, they have they seem to have lots of ideas for chicken nuggets on there yep. there's always some really good ideas to look at gotcha thanks Sorry, Sharon, I think you might be on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we, hi, we um, tend to poach chicken breast. Um, we find that poaching is tasty, it's moist, but also it's not labour intensive. Um, you know, once you sort of get that poaching water and then you simmer it for a couple of minutes and switch it off and let it sit, it's something that you can straight away move on to something else while that finishes cooking. It's easy to shred. It's healthy. It's a green choice. Um, and then you can combine that, um, you know, with a salad. And it's Another a lot thing more we, cost effective too. Yes, it is more cost effective. Mm. Another thing we do with chicken is we used to get, um, for our burgers, we used to, um, for our chicken option, we have three options. We have a vegan option, a beef option, and a chicken option. We use Angel Bay beef burgers which are, um, have yeah, a high, they're, they're lovely. They're a high-end product, yeah. mm. minimal sort of of those industrial ingredients. I don't think it has any. Um, obviously, we serve the burger with salad in it. Um, and with the chicken, we used to have a, a product from Specialized Chicken, which was sort of like a compressed char grilled breast. Um, but we switched to free-range chicken breast, which even though free-range you're paying more for it, you're still paying a lot less just when you buy, you can buy it in bulk, and um, we we sort of fillet them and we pan fry them in a bit of olive oil, and we use that as a um, instead of a burger, a patty for our chicken burgers. And we sort of could probably do about thirty five of those chicken chicken ones, about thirty five beef ones, and about two vegan ones on a Friday. Um, and, you know, we are lucky because we have a lot of volunteers. So pretty much most of our menu is made in-house and it's made from scratch and it's green. Um, with the exception of we do have home bake every second break, um, but they are all um, portion controlled um, and we lower the salt, the sugar and the fat in those home bake home recipes. Bake, uh, home bake items something that you make? Yes, yeah. So we, we pre-COVID, we had um, a roster of home bakers 
which is a great way of enabling people who want to help out but who can't help in the kitchen. Um, and we would give them a, um, a list of recipes that were healthier. And um, question. that was a way, yeah. How do you get your volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, slow and cumulative process. I find that volunteers beget volunteers. When I started in the job 10 years ago, I had been a volunteer and we kind of had a very minimal, we had about, so I have about 50 volunteers. And so that's why, that's why I'm amazed when I see what you guys are putting out with your stuff, with your staffing. I just think you're amazing. Oh, um, Karen, I think we need to come and interview you and see what you actually do. Don't you think, Chrissy? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think we definitely need to come and interview you, maybe even do a podcast with what you do oh, for volunteers. Look, look, I would love to share what I do um, because it, it works for us. But, mm. I mean, our idea is that to try and be really brief because we know that everybody is busy. Um, we know that people may only be able to offer an hour a month. So when I say a volunteer, that volunteer isn't coming in every week. I find yep. there are very, very few people that can ever do that anymore. Um, but if we have a big team, people can contribute as they're able. It um, mm -hmm. takes a bit of organising at the beginning of the year, but then pretty much after that, it's self-sustaining. So, um, and volunteers tend to bring volunteers. They might bring their mums. We have grandparents. We have dads. Um, and the idea is to make it a light load so that people enjoy coming and they encourage others to come. Um, we also, I also operate the uniform shop. And I think that the preppy outfitting at the beginning of the year and also on prep experience day, which is usually in November, um, is a wonderful opportunity. We do that. I do that with a handful of volunteers who are tuck shop volunteers. It's just a really great um, greet and meet opportunity because you have that extra time while you're outfitting those kids mm. and people just see how friendly the school is and mm. they want to be involved. So we give them, you know, information about the tuck shop at that point. We give them a flyer. Um, sometimes they write their names down then. So you're kind of catching people. Um, you're a welcoming party, but you're also catching people when they first enter school. So yeah. you're getting um, people early. Well, Many green. of our volunteers, sorry. <laughs> Get them while they're green. <laughs> yes, and, and because, of course, that's when they're really keen. They're sort of handing their child over to school and they want to be involved in the school as much as they can. Mm -hmm. So it's a really opportunistic moment. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that we have huge longevity with our volunteers. Once they come, they usually stay for several years. We have volunteers whose children no longer go to the school. Um, and it's actually just a really lovely um community experience i think a lot so we've been closed actually since um the first week of december we had a big flood in december and we closed in week nine which um, school are you sorry it's sorry which ithaca school creek. ithaca creek so we're not a big school um we're not a big school tanya lee we've got You've about got 630 principal. students you've got um, chris Rebecca as your principal Yes, yes. He's our, yeah. he's our old principal oh, here. Oh, right, right, yeah. So um, and we lost a lot of um, volunteers through COVID. Um, mm. We got down to 65% of our usual volunteer load, um, which is not surprising because there's a natural attrition as people leave the school or their lives change. But also we didn't have that opportunity to connect with people particularly incoming families, because we had a socially distanced uniform shop. Obviously, parents weren't able to come on the grounds. And so we did lose volunteers. And we haven't relaunched this year. It's the first time in 10 years we haven't had tuck shop because we've just been, um, you know, with closure, the extended closure, and then we've just been hit again with another flood. But, you know, it's... Um, a good opportunity to re rejig things but we do a lot of green things because we have the volunteer numbers and also because we switched to flexi schools online ordering eight years ago that saved a heap of um staff time it saved us probably four hours easily and in any week because you're counting change we have streamlined menus like yours tanya lee so to minimize waste um, 
And in doing that, you know, if you have bag orders, people can order the wrong thing on the wrong day if they're not paying attention. But if you have it online, people can only order what they are able to have on any given day. You can track missing things or problems because you have that um, record. We get an automatic run sheet. All of that just helps us churn mm. out a lot of handmade food as quickly as we can. And also more parents came on board with the online ordering. So our, um, our school has grown, but also Flexi Schools. Flexi Schools has quadrupled our ordering. So we usually have about 400 orders on a Friday. When I started, we had about 90. And I think that's partly to do with school growth, but mostly to do with online ordering. It's just really convenient. It will save you so much time. I was just going to say, um, with the online ordering, do you all, is it a, with Flexi Schools, it is, is it also a, a point of sale system that you have? We don't use it. Um, we only have pre-ordering. Um, and we do have counter service for second break because we like to give our students an opportunity to be a customer in a safe environment. Yes. And they, they just have limited snack options that they can buy at the counter. But anything that requires um, us to prepare food must be pre-ordered. So we know exactly what we're up for um, at the beginning of the day. And we prepare it all. We put it in paper bags that goes into a class bucket which is collected by the class and distributed from there. Sharon, thanks for sharing all of that. That's wonderful information. I hope you get back up and running soon, you poor thing. Yes. <laughs> month, that's too much, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 anyone else have anything else quickly? Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to end the recording now. I will just stop that.